what you really need to do is look at all of the evidence that's presented to you and figure out what area of risk you are comfortable with and make a decision that feels best and right for you. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Elizabeth, also known as Nurse Sabe, here on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok if you want to follow me on those other platforms. And I am a labor and delivery nurse, postpartum nurse, and certified childbirth educator, as well as a mom to three. And so today's video is actually just going to be a Q&A from questions. I put a poll over on Instagram and had you guys submit questions. Go ahead and if you have any questions that you would like for a future Q&A video, because I think I'm going to continue to make these every few months or so, please leave that question in the comments down below. So if you could give this video a thumbs up, comment, share, subscribe, all of those beautiful things. It helps the algorithm and it helps me make more videos. And if you have any new video suggestions for 2023, I've got some in the works, but of course I'm always looking for suggestions from you guys. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into spilling the tea. Mmm, cranberry vanilla, super delish. So my first question actually doesn't come from Instagram. It comes from one of you guys here who commented on a recent video. Hey, I would love if you could tell me a little bit about biophysical profiles. So I thought this Q&A would be the perfect time to do so. A biophysical profile, and basically it's give us like a little window in and say, hey, baby, how are you doing in there? You liking it? That placenta's still working? You're feeling good? You've got enough fluid? All that stuff. And then it's a way for baby to communicate with us as well. So it's a simple test where they perform a non-stress test on the baby, which is where they hook you up to the contraction monitor and the fetal heart rate monitor, and they will look at the baby's heart rate. And what they're looking for with the non-stress stress test is that baby through their heart rate with moderate variability and accelerations is telling us in that moment that they are well oxygenated. And then you also, in addition to the non-stress test, will have an ultrasound where they look at several different things that your baby should be doing at the gestational age that they are. These things include practice breathing, big movements, little movements or tone, and also amniotic fluid. And based on the scores that are tallied for both the non-stress test and those four things, your baby can be scored out of 10 points, but in increments of two. So eight to 10 is considered normal, six is equivocal, and four or less is considered abnormal and might be need for further investigation or for an induction of delivery. So biophysical profiles are performed Sometimes, not always in the third trimester, only if there's an, an issue going on. So maybe let's say you've gone past your due date, you're, you're nearing 42 weeks. We wanna make sure that baby is still doing well in utero and that the placenta is still working well. Sometimes it might be considered if you have any blood pressure issues during your pregnancy or diabetes issues during your pregnancy or any other issues that are related to pregnancy. Sometimes we might see if your infant is growth restricted or IUGR or if you have multiple fetuses, anything like that. Okay. So I have a question said how to prepare for a VBAC delivery of baby number two. So I actually have a whole video on VBACs. It's fairly old, but the information's still pretty good in there. So I would definitely go check out that video. So I think the best thing to do to prepare for your VBAC or your vaginal birth after cesarean. So if you are attempting a VBAC, then we are gonna call that a TOLAC, which is trial of labor after cesarean, if you wanna know all the lingo. So I think the best thing to do is to go and request your medical records and read your note from your delivery and try to surmise what was going on that was responsible for the need for an alternate route of delivery because your provider might not have communicated that well with you or you might have been a little bit out of it and not remember exactly what happened. So that note might be fairly helpful. It could tell us if your baby was having heart rate issues, if there was a stall in dilation, if your baby was malpositioned. Now the things that you can affect for future pregnancies and future deliveries is helping your baby to get into the best position possible. That is what you can affect and being in the best position possible, it can potentially help fix any issues with your fetal heart rate because sometimes babies will have decelerations in their heart rate based on positioning and compression of the vagal nerve. It also can help decrease the risk of having an arrest of dilation or arrest of descent. 
because when babies are in the best position possible, this allows for the smallest part of the crown of their head to be attempting to fit through the birth canal, and that is always going to be easiest. I really recommend checking out Spinning Babies, Gilligan's Guide as two really great resources for helping your baby to get in the best position possible. Spitting Babies is an amazing global organization that really focuses on physiological birth and fetal positioning to optimize labor, birth, and comfort in pregnancy. So I highly recommend you look up parent educators in your area as well. And I actually am very newly certified in being a parent educator for Spitting Babies, and I will be offering classes in that shortly in the new year if that's something that you're interested in. The next thing that you can do to help your baby get into the very best position possible is to help your body be aligned and comfortable and relax where it needs to be relaxed and have tone where it needs to have tone. So seeking out care from a pelvic floor physical therapist can be really, really beneficial. Also potentially seeking out care from a chiropractor who specializes in the Webster technique is going to be beneficial there as well. And I would also consider hiring a doula to be with you during your birth to help advocate for your wishes and to help be another go-between with staff members. Now, speaking of staff members, I think it's also really important that you find a provider who is going to be as helpful with your VBAC as possible. So when you're interviewing different providers in your area, finding one that allows you to go past your due date, finding one who is okay with inducing VBACs if necessary, because again, all of these things are backed by evidence and backed by ACOG, which is the governing board for the obstetrician. It's important though to find physicians who feel comfortable managing VBAC because that's gonna give you the biggest chance for success. The other thing that I would consider is of course taking a childbirth education class, practicing your coping techniques. So I think going in with the flexibility and, and the ability to know what you want, but kind of take the steps that you need to get there. Maybe it is you thought you weren't going to have an epidural and then you find that an epidural is what you need. Giving yourself and allowing yourself to have that kind of flexibility and just know that you are doing everything to help get your baby here safely. And if your TOLAC does result in another cesarean birth, that even just going into labor and allowing your body and those hormones to happen is really beneficial for your baby. But also, if you do not want to be back and you want to have a scheduled cesarean birth for your second birth, that is okay too. What you really need to do is look at all of the evidence that's presented to you and figure out what area of risk you are comfortable with and make a decision that feels best and right for you. Next question. This is actually one that I hear fairly frequently or I hear a lot of anxiety about when my patients find out that this has happened to them. My first baby was born with the cord around her neck. Does this mean that my second I would need a c-section? So having the cord around your baby's neck or around their body or around their foot or just wrapped around them happens in about a third of births. We have a cord that is in some way wrapped around your baby. And in general, this is not something that we screen for because it's so common and it typically does not result in any sort of emergencies for a couple of reasons. One, when we picture a cord around a neck, we picture our baby not being able to breathe, but your baby isn't breathing in utero. It is getting supplied blood flow through that umbilical cord. The other thing that that umbilical cord has is something called Wharton's jelly, which allows it to be compressed and kind of protects the blood vessels that are supplying blood to the baby and taking blood back from the baby for filtration through your body. Now, the one thing that we will have to think about is sometimes in labor, when we have contractions and that cord gets compressed further, we can see some dips or some decelerations in the fetal heart rate. The good news is, is that our babies have quite a bit of reserve. And so even with decelerations, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to move to a cesarean birth. We have to look at how deep are those decelerations? What is the fetal heart rate looking like in between? Is labor progressing as we would expect? And all of those things will definitely play a role in how we then continue to manage care. But I have seen many babies have the cord wrapped around their neck, be born, and we had no idea about it until baby's birth. And so when your baby's head comes out, typically the provider will check for the cord and if it's able to slip off, they'll slip it off or they can even birth baby through the cord. Now there can be injuries with the cord if that cord is wrapped super, super tightly or if baby somehow develops a true knot in the cord that then gets pulled really taut. If your baby's not able to get blood flow through the cord, then they are not going to be able to sustain life. So 
This is why kick counts at the end of your pregnancy are so important. Starting at about 28 weeks, you want to do kick counts one to two times a day where you are doing it at the same time every day. And in two hours, you want to feel 10 movements. So if you're feeling less movement or movement has ramped up like crazy, those are both indications that we would like you to seek out your healthcare provider and just do some screening to make sure that your baby is doing well in utero. Okay, paying attention to those kick counts, super important. But okay, I'm gonna answer a few questions about pumping and breastfeeding because I got this question a couple of times. When do your nipples stop growing in pregnancy to measure flange size is one question. The next one is, do your nipples size change with each pregnancy, buying flanges for the next baby? Y'all, your nipple sizes can change even during pumping. I did not realize that. I just need you guys to know, the flanges that come with your pump are normally going to be too big. They come with like a 24 or 25 and a 27 and a 28. Very few people need the 28. Some people will use the 24. Most people need a 21 or smaller. So getting fitted is important. But your nipple size can change between pregnancies. It can also change while you're pumping. So with my oldest, I used the 24. That's what came with it and it worked, but it, prob it definitely was too big. My, my nipples would hit the end of the flange. With my second, I got professionally fitted and a 21 was what was recommended. And that worked great for me. I exclusively pumped with a 21 for 12 months and it worked fabulously. With my third baby, I was pumping with the 21 and it was pulling in too much tissue. And I was actually getting cracks around the base of my nipple, which was not fun at all, super painful. So that's when I started using the Bogen cushions with the 21s to bring it down to actually about a 19 and that's what I've used with this baby and it's fit and worked beautifully. So if you are exclusively pumping I'd recommend waiting until about 36 weeks to do a fitting and maybe just buy like one set of flanges that you think will fit you and go from there and even maybe buy a set of flanges and then the Bogen cushions because those are so versatile and helping to change flange size quickly if things are uncomfortable. But if you're planning on putting the baby to the breast, I would wait at least two weeks because we do see some swelling, some extra fluid from labor and delivery that can affect nipple and flange sizing. And not only might you need a different flange size once you start pumping than you think, but you might even need like a different type of flange. So we have the traditional hard plastic, we have the Bogen cushion inserts that I love. We also have silicone flanges. So what I think is best is if you don't go wild during pregnancy buying a whole bunch of stuff. I know we love to be prepared. The next question, again about breastfeeding, that I think I really wanna cover is, there's a lot of emphasis on having to build up a breast milk supply. Is that necessary? You've seen the people with the deep freezers full of milk and pumping massive amounts every single time they pump. I want you to know that's an oversupply and that's not normal. It has some negatives to it though, mastitis, clogged ducts, maybe a heavy letdown. So not super fun for you or baby necessarily, but who should be building your supply is your baby. Your baby should be building your supply, especially in the first few weeks. If your baby is feeding well, having an appropriate amount of pee and poop diapers, gaining weight well, you wanna let your baby build your supply. But if you're going back to work, around three to four weeks, you want to start introducing the bottle a couple of times a week, every day even, to make sure that your baby will take the bottle. Because you're using the bottle doesn't mean that you need to give a full feed with the bottle half an ounce to an ounce before or after a feed just to get them used to it with paste bottle feeding so that when you go back to work at six, 12, whatever weeks, your baby is able to take a bottle. And if you start adding a fictitious feed around that three to four week mark as well, basically in the evening when you get a little bit of a longer stretch, you can add a pumping session. You'll start collecting small amounts of milk. It's great to have a few days in the freezer for when you head back to work, but your baby should be building your supply. The baby is the builder. They are telling your body exactly how much to make. If you start pumping every single time after you feed, you will get into a pretty uncomfortable habit of having to always do that because now your body thinks it needs to make the milk for two babies, your baby and your pump. But of course, if you're having any supply issues, any concerns at all about breastfeeding, this is not a video to tell you what to do. I recommend making an appointment with an international board certified lactation consultant, which can be in person or virtual. There are so many amazing virtual options and I will leave some of my favorites Instagrams below where you can do virtual visits. So here is another question that I got that I definitely really wanted to cover. And this is a little bit of uh, spilling the tea for sure. Why don't all docs and nurses seem to know about updated best practice? I was discouraged from open glottis pushing and my position wasn't changed for three hours. 
I want to say this in general, and I also want to say this with the understanding that I work at a facility that isn't 100% like this, but if your nurse, and I can only speak to nurses, if they learn about giving birth only through being taught in the hospital, then they are going to learn those practices, and that's what they are going to think is the norm. If they don't go seek outside training, outside learning, different perspectives of birth, physiological versus medicalized birth, then they might not know that what they're doing isn't evidence-based. If their facility isn't working diligently to educate them, and also that the providers are on board with this education and these changes, then they're not going to have the knowledge. And it sucks. It sucks because they all, we all, okay, I was in this boat too when I first started. I didn't know that you were supposed to change positions when you were pushing. All of my patients pushed on their backs. Sometimes we would use like tug of war method, but pushed on their backs and held their breaths. And pushing on your back and holding your breath might feel good for you, but it also might not. And so now I understand how many different options there are because my facility is changing and, and the nurses and the culture is changing around pushing, but also because I personally have taken on the responsibility of getting education from different avenues, different nurses. I've done doula training. I have done a lot of things so that I can bring the best birth to my patients. And then through me and other nurses like me in my facility doing this, we have been able to spread this knowledge when we have new grads come in but it takes time to change. And so it's hard to know, right? Talk with your provider, but you shouldn't have to be fighting for yourself during birth. Bringing in a support person or a doula who knows your wishes and can help you advocate for what you'd like to do. If you have somebody who's like not changing your positions or telling you you need to hold your breath and that doesn't feel good or right for you, I think saying, hey, I hear where you're coming from. I'd like to try it my way for a few contractions and see how progress is being made. And then we can, we can switch to something else if that's not working. But I think a lot of providers, nurses, and doctors alike would be surprised and are surprised when they see the changes that pushing in different positions in particular can make on the pushing process. So I'm really sorry that you weren't heard and listened to. That absolutely sucks. I want you to know that a lot of us are putting in the work to change things across the United States. Change takes time. And I'm sorry that we are all having to wait for that because it, it does truly stink. Okay, this is the last one and I got this a few times. Are you done having kids and how do you know? I go back and forth daily. How do I accept I'm done having babies? I love the birth process but can't raise anymore me. We are done, done having kids. Not like, oh yeah, we're done. Um, we are done, done, like snip, snap, snip, snap, done, done. And then oh, when you said that you might want to have kids and I wasn't so sure who had the fact reversed. And then when you said you definitely didn't want to have kids, who had it reversed back? Snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap. And I, I still haven't, I don't think truly processed it because Rosie is still nursing. She's still like a, a little, mostly bald little baby. So in my head, she's still a baby. She still wakes up sometimes like three or four times a night. That's a whole nother story. So I, I, I am sad and I am going to miss it so much, but I know the decision for us, which was one that was both motivated financially, like three kids is the amount of kids that we are able to afford and still live the life and, and provide what we would like to provide for our children. And also just like, how thin can you be stretched? I think we all are so different, but three children for me, I, I feel stretched pretty thin. And I think if I had another one that, that things would, would snap and break, particularly when taking into account mental health and how hard my last two pregnancies were with postpartum depression and anxiety and how deep and dark things got with the, my last two children. I know that I can't do that again, not only for myself, but also for the children that I do have who are already alive. 
Now, I love giving birth. I don't really love being pregnant, but I think I always look back at it with rose-colored glasses, how cool it was to feel another baby move inside of me. I think a lot of us, when we're having kids, we, we imagine the babies and the toddlers, and we don't imagine the older kids, but the older kids are fun and engaging and so smart and just like, I am loving my older children and my children as they get older and having their own ideas and opinions, which sometimes, yes, make me want to pull my hair out, but in general are just really engaging and exciting. And I know that I'm always going to look back and miss that new baby smell and I'm going to miss giving birth and being pregnant. But I know that ultimately for me and in making the decision with my husband, like this is what felt best and right for our family. And also, Rosie's crazy and at 18 months old can climb out of her crib in a sleep sack and open her bedroom door. So I don't think that I could have another child because she is just so absolutely insane. So please let me know, how did you know that you were done having kids? How did you make that decision? Was it hard and fast or, or was it more gradual? Because I'm always curious on how we all are making these decisions. Okay. So that's the Q&A. If you have any other questions or any comments or concerns or anything, just leave them down below in the comments. Let's chat down there. And until next time, bye guys.